probably do about a dozen or so. And then uh, right now, uh, I think it's the first Sunday in June, uh, right now I'm planning, I haven't done this in here, uh, and I may not do it again, it depends on how it goes, but uh, 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 I'm going to begin teaching through uh, the New Testament book of Philippians. And uh, the, the reason, you know, hopefully everything I do is biblical, but the reason that I haven't taken a book is some people, when, when you're in a book, you make your way through and they miss a few weeks, they feel like, well, you know, they're already in chapter two, we missed chapter one, so there's no reason to go. I think sometimes it discourages people from coming. But I'm going to give it a shot, okay, and, uh, and see how it works. And then uh, uh, at some point I'll return to the Psalms again for another 10 to 12, and then we'll do something else. But I just didn't want to get into the Psalms and stay three and a half years in them, okay? <laughs> All right, because by then I felt like we'd be tearing it out of our Bible. And I didn't want us to go there. So a little bit of kind of where, uh, where we're going. Exploring the Psalms. Today's Psalm is Psalm 32. Psalm 32. Uh, long title. Uh, forgiveness is the blessing of confessing. Forgiveness is the blessing of confessing. I want you to look uh, look at the next slide. And I want you to see uh, uh, these, uh, these words. Read those to yourself. <clears throat> How would you respond if you got that correspondence in a letter? Well, Arthur Conan Doyle. You don't have any idea who that is, neither do I. He's the mastermind and the creator of Sherlock Holmes. Okay, the fictional character Sherlock Holmes. And he was a huge practical joker. He sent those words on a telegram to 12 of his friends anonymously. Okay? They all fled. <laughs> Seriously, they all ran. I mean, scary. Psalm 32 is one of seven, they're called penitential, not penitentiary. Okay, penitential. Psalms of, repent, of repentance, of brokenness, of confession. Psalm 32 is written out of David's personal experience. Uh, I think I put the context there for you, but uh, in 2 uh, Samuel uh, 11, 12, right in there. Most of us know the story. Uh, David should have been about king's business, but he got lazy and he stayed at home and he should have been out uh, doing the things that kings need to, uh, to do. And he walked out from his high vantage point and saw a lovely young lady that was naked and he said, that looks nice. And uh, so he uh, uh, lies with her, which is a gracious way to put it. And uh, she gets pregnant. So he moves into a deception to have uh, her husband uh, hopefully kill, and eventually that happens. About a year later, David has been hiding this sin for a year. Psalm 51, which we'll get to later, describes that year. Psalm 32 describes what happened after that year when Nathan, the prophet, confronted him? And he tells him this horrific story of, uh, of, of what a king did. And when he finishes, David said, Let me at him! Let me at him! And Nathan says, You're the guy! You're the man! And then he says, You know, I have uh, I acknowledge my sin. What you and I have here in Psalm 32 is really David's song of, I think, of praise and adoration and worship for experiencing the forgiveness of God after the, uh, the uh, uh, put it off for a year. And then he finally says, I'm guilty, I've done it. Okay? That's the background of the song. Let's, let me read it. Powerful song. Blessed. There's only one other song that begins with that word. You know what that is? Psalm 1. Psalm 
Only one. Blessed. Blessed. Blessed is one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed. Double blessed. Is the man against whom, ladies, you're not left out there. Okay, you're just as much a sinner as the man. Okay, that's just a generic term for all of us. Okay, if it had been for you, ladies, we wouldn't have sin anyways. So, <laughs> blessed is the man. Okay, I am not about to look up. I'm just going to keep reading. Okay, okay. I expect some glare, so I'm just going to kind of keep going here. Okay, I can't believe I said that. That was not the smartest thing that I've ever said. But my wife is warning her ears, Jimmy. It's not. It sometimes it's not what you say, it's, it's how you say it. It's the problem, which is true. Blessed is the man who the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now it's kind of referring back, looking back to what's more recorded in Psalm 51. For when I kept silent, when I didn't confess, when I held on, when I hid it, when I excused it, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. Now let me pause there. And address two terms. Some of you in your translation and in your Bible have a, a superscription at the beginning of this psalm. I don't know why some translations don't call a maskil. Somebody would have that? That's in a few songs. That, uh, I'm not sure, there's a, I don't know who you read, it's a, it's a literary or a musical term, and you remember David was a very musical person. So I'm not sure, you know, uh, which it is or both. But the term refers to teaching, content, information, preaching. There's something about this song by way of teaching, uh, information, content, that brings a doubt uh, to the teaching that's not present in some of the other psalms of David. Okay, does that make sense? So this is a mass skill. It's a teaching psalm. I think the others don't have content. They do. But this is a teaching psalm. And then you see Selah. And you'll see it two other times in just a minute. That, uh, that's a term that's used to say, stop. You just heard something. Stop. Pause. And reflect. Think about what you just heard. That's what David said. Think about it. Let's not move on too quick. Pause and reflect. Which is a lost skill, art, practice in our Instagram world. Okay? Uh, the last thing most of the time we want to do is pause, stop, and think and reflect. We want to move on. David said, no, no, no. There are points in here, at least three. We need to stop and think about what was just written. Now, okay, now, back to, to uh, uh, verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. See <laughs> Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely, in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule. Now my guess is that probably the message or the living Bible might say, don't be a jackass. Okay? Not that any of us Christians could ever take on that mentality. Alright? Be not like a horse or a mule, without understanding, which must be curved with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love, we keep coming back to that tacit, faithful, covenant-keeping, forgiving love of God, surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in the heart. Great song. Great song. Let's look at it. In the first two verses, take your outline, it should be there on the table. 
I label this the pleasure, the blessedness that we feel when sin is cleansed. All of us in the room who know Christ, it may have been a long time. It may have been as recent as this morning. But we all surely have experienced the pleasure, the blessedness, the relief of forgiveness. It's almost like you've just been able, you carried something, carried something, you knew you shouldn't have carried it, and, and, and eventually you make it right, it's almost like you can breathe again. Okay. It's finally out. It's finally uncovered. I'm finally clean. That's what he's saying here. Now, notice in, verse, in verses 1 and 2, he has four different terms or words that he uses for sin. Transgression, we can underline that uh, sin. Uh, iniquity and deceit. Now I ask myself the question, why would David in this psalm on confession and forgiveness, why would he give us four different terms that all have a little bit, I'll get to let you know what they are, have a little bit different shade of meaning, why would he do that? And here's what I think his point is. He's trying to illustrate to us. It doesn't matter what your sin is. It doesn't matter what kind or how much. It doesn't matter the type. God forgives. Because I've dealt with people, and some of you have as well, that I said, well listen, God may forgive everybody else, but why does anything He can't forgive? That's the devil's lie. There's not anything for which Jesus did not shed His blood and forgiveness is not possible. Even repetitive sins. That's David's whole point here. And he mentioned uh, uh, that transgression. The value there is defiance. Willful, rebellious, hard-headed, defiant, revolt uh, 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 against God. Uh, second is, uh, 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 the second word there is sin. The word there is uh, sin is a defect. It's the same word transliterated in the New Testament. Uh, all have sinned, Romans 3.23. All have sinned. You remember the rest of it? They fall short of God of the glory of God. God has a mark. God has a standard. That standard is perfection. We cannot achieve. We all fall short. It doesn't matter how far short you fall. If I tell you in order to get right with God, you have to swim to Bermuda. We all drown. Yeah, but I can swim further than you. Yeah, but you're just as dead as I am. Yeah, but... Watch this, because this is an excuse a lot of you. Yeah, but I, I, I did better than you did. I was, I was gooder than you were. See, goodness is the argument that a lot of people take about, well, listen, I'm better than most people go to church. I am a good person. Well, that depends on your standard for goodness. And when the rich young ruler approached Jesus, and he called him good teacher, remember what Jesus asked? Why do you call me good? See, the standard of goodness is the perfection of Jesus. And I don't care how good you and I are, we don't measure up to that. We all fall short. That's what David is using this word for. We all fall short. And then he uses the term, verse 2, iniquity. Iniquity is almost the result of the first two that are practiced over a long period of time. The soul, the spirit gets crooked. It gets bent. Twisted is the idea in this third word. And then the fourth word is deception. Deception is what we try to do regardless of the type of sin when we try not to be responsible for it. When we try to, uh, not my fault. When we try to minimize it. When, I, mean, I don't know what David said, okay, but, uh, you know, maybe David said when he walked on the roof of his place and looked down and saw that beautiful naked woman, not my fault, I didn't put her there. You know, God, God didn't live in your fault. You had her come out when I came out, and then not my fault. Just minimizing and making excuses and rationalizing that what I did, what I said, that was sinful, I should have done. And not being responsible for it. So, now he moves into the aspects of each of those types of sins being dealt with and how God deals with it. 
Notice, blessed is the one whose transgression, rebellion, revolt against God is forgiven. The idea there is the Old Testament sending away of a sacrifice that God has taken care of that rebellion. And He has sent that away. Next it says our sin is covered. Uh, completely covered. Ladies, we get transliterated into, eventually into English. Uh, the idea behind this is a blemish. Sin is a blemish. Uh, ladies, what, what do you do? Guys, we're hopeless. What do you do when you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and overnight through your horrors, this huge zit has appeared on your face? <laughs> Not that that has ever happened to you. Okay? Okay? Do you leave it exposed? Not in a million years. Okay? You cover it up. That's so unfair to guys. It's just so unfair. Okay? We're just stuck out there with this huge white hand. And there you are, you cover it up. But well, that's the idea here. Uh, in terms of the word here for good. I'm covering it over. But what is he covering over with? Not makeup. But his blood. Notice the next part. Who does not count, uh, or uh, the Lord counts no iniquity. Sin creates a debt. We are debtors because we are sinners. If you look at the column, okay, our debt, okay, it's just one sin after another, okay? Even if I give you the first ten years of your life as perfection, which would be a huge stretch for every human fallen sinful human being. But let's say you lived a perfect life the first 10 years of your life. We just made you even perfect when you were in the terrible twos and threes. Okay? And then when you hit 10, you sin three times a day. And I, I feel like I had gone to heaven if I only sinned three times a day. Okay? But three times a day, 365 days a year, we'll round it off to a thousand sins. Okay? Here you are, you're age 10, you have a thousand sins in a year. But let's say you live to 50, you die early. Okay? That's 40 years times 1,000. You feel the load? Okay? We didn't start ascending until 10, and we only did three a day, and I gave you 65 days free. And we've got 40,000. And we were blessed to die at 50. Huge load. I say that's a huge load. Huge. And it says, He does not hold that against us. I heard about fellas talking to one of his buddies. And he said, You know what? I'm so sick and tired of arguing with my wife. He said, Every time we get into an argument, she gets historical. <laughs> He said, no, I'm in his heart. <laughs> Why? He said, because she brings up everything that I did wrong. <laughs> everything that I did. God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. Look at the, the next slide. You remember this? Horatio G. Spafford. Remember that? Uh, back in the 1800s, uh, my wife, five kids, uh, successful, and uh, uh, had one their, uh, one child die of scarlet fever. Uh, he put his wife and four daughters on a boat uh, to Europe uh, for a vacation and said that he would join them later. Uh, the boat hit a barge and sunk. All four of the daughters drowned. Only his wife survived. And she sent him a telegram. That said, saved alone. And he eventually joined her. He wrote, It is well with my soul on the ship going over to meet his wife after he had lost all four of his daughters, having previously lost his son. This is the third stanza. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I 
powerful pen that we realize the context in which he was writing. And he says the blessed. In fact, it uses uh, this this first uh, this, this first point opens with blessed, and then there's a second. It's really it's very uh, Hebrew language is very interesting. The word blessed is plural. In other words, it really reads this way: blessed nessers are those whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is covered. Blessed nessers is those is the man whose uh, uh, the Lord counts no iniquity. The pleasure. When you and I know that our sin is in forgiven. Alright, look at the next point. The penalty, the price, the cost. When we do what David did for one year, and that is try to conceal it and try to hide it. I'm reminded of when the uh, Hebrew nation was uh, uh, was uh, about to enter into the land of Canaan, the conquering. And there were three tribes, half of Manasseh, all of Gad, and all of Reuben, who wanted to stay on the eastern shore of the Jordan River and not go in and fight for the land. And Moses told them, you can come back, but you must go in and help us conquer the land. Because if you don't, and here's a verse you recall, Numbers 32 and 23. Be sure your sin will find you out. Moses didn't say, be sure your sin will be found out. Moses says, be sure your sin and not doing what you should have done, it will find you out. God already knows. It will find you out. And that's what we see happening in the life of David very graphically here in the, in, the, in these two verses. Uh, one of uh, Pastor David, he, every, every, every uh, teacher has a guy of mine, God bless your sin, sex, for love. So, but one of David's is, and I wrote in my notes, we are only as sick as our secrets. We are only as sick as our secrets. In other words, hiding things doesn't help us. It doesn't make things better. And as David looks back, notice what he says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Those are the physical symptoms of unconfessed sin and guilt. Physically. Uh, headaches, stomach aches, muscle tension, all sorts of physical uh, effects from hiding sin. And then he goes on, Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. I think that's the emotional and psychological effect of the hand of... We want the hand of God on our life, but we want the hand of God on our life to bless us and to guide us and not so much to convict us. And David felt the heavy, heavy hand of God on his life as a result of trying to hide his sin. You remember... Uh, how many million? hundred... Almost 200 years ago, 175. Edgar Allan Poe's uh, uh, work, The Tell Tale Heart. You remember the story? Okay. This guy kills someone and buries him in the basement. Okay. Then he gets haunted hearing the heartbeat of the person he had killed buried in the basement. And that goes on and on and on, that heartbeat pounding and pounding and pounding and pounding in his chest and in his head. And then he finally realizes that pounding is not the heart of the dead man. It's the guilt of me. I'm guilty. Powerful, powerful, powerful story. Let, I need a uh, kind of pause uh, here and, and make a little distinction. I don't have time to dwell on that between what's, how do you know how do you know the difference between the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the spirit of condemnation? Well, sometimes we deal with both of those. Which is, the Holy Spirit in convicting us will always move us toward God. Whereas condemnation will always be more inwardly focused for how bad we are. One moves us toward God, one moves us really away from God. Draws us away from Him. Okay? And then in verse 4b, he says, My strength 
was all dried up. Just a graphic, graphic uh, uh, picture. Look at this uh, proverb. Uh, Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals, hides, there's that word, transgressions, their sinfulness, will not, will not succeed, will not have fullness, will not have joy, will not have peace. But he who confesses, uh, gets it out, agrees, we'll about that minute, and forsakes, leaves the sin, will obtain mercy. It's a great, great text. Will obtain mercy. Alright? Now, pick up in verse 5. And the third point here is uh, dealing with when we, uh, the pardon, the pardon that we find when sin is confessed. When sin is confessed. Look, let me show you something. You've got a penny to mark. Look at verse 5. Notice how, notice how, though David's talked about the different kinds of sin, notice how David now takes personal responsibility and ownership for what he did, which is critical. He doesn't try to deceive anymore, he doesn't try to justify it. How do we know that? I want you to notice the repetition of the personal pronoun I and my. I and my. Okay? I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. See, that taking that personal uh, 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 responsibility, to confess means to agree with God that you did it. 1 John uh, 1 9, okay? If we say our sins to God, that is not what Scripture says. But that's what a ton of times we do. We don't take our sins seriously enough. Have you ever, is, has this ever been your prayer profession, uh, our confession? And Lord, if I did any sins today, would you just please forgive all of them? <laughs> well, let me ask you a question. Do we do our sins generally or specifically? <laughs> we do them specifically. Okay? Then we deal with them that way. It just that added that kind of prayer is an attitude that says, I don't take my sin seriously. We confess, we agree with God. David uh, uh, Altberg, who is uh, still, I think, a teaching professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, has written a bunch of books, but he wrote a book uh, 30 years ago on forgiveness. This is what he says about confession. You must own up to your sinfulness. Admit your helplessness, your weakness, your need. Yes, this is the negative side, but it is the necessary side. Guilt wants to stay hidden. It breathes best in isolation. It loves the dark, unswept corners of our personalities. Like a termite, it eats and destroys when hidden. But when brought to the light, it dries up and dies. Confess it. Get it out. Admit it. And then he says, look at verse 5, and you, he, you know, I, my, I have done it, and you refuse to forgive me. Oh, and you condemned me for my sin. And you judged me. No, what does it say? You forgave me. You forgave the crookedness and the perverseness and the brokenness of my faultiness. You forgave everything. No wonder, he says, see God. Stop and think about that. Some of you have had, uh, your problem has been more, has been less about knowing that God has forgiven you and more about your unwillingness to forgive yourself. Let me uh, take you to a passage in 1 John 3. John writes, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure, have assurance, confidence, security of our heart, our lives before Him. For whenever our heart condemns us, that's that inner condemnation, okay, that we beat ourselves uh, relentlessly uh, with. God is greater than our heart. He knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we should have confidence before God. And then then lose it, and then whatever we ask, uh, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. 
all, all sin that you and I commit is ultimately against God. Okay. I, I may do something or say something to my wife or to my kids or a co-worker or something that is sinful. Do something. And, and I have sinned against them, but ultimately, I, all sin is against a holy and a righteous God. And if if God is willing to forgive us of any type of sin, and they had experienced any type of sin, and yet we refuse to forgive ourselves, then have we stopped to think that we have in so doing made ourselves greater than God? <coughs> If the God that you and I sin against is more than eager to forgive us of our sinfulness and fallenness, then what right do you and I have not to forgive ourselves? That is to place ourselves above even the holiness of God. Who would, who would knowing that, who would do that? But we all in the room know we're not bigger and better than God. Unbelievable. I want to show you a two-minute clip. Some of you are old enough to remember. It's a 1986 film, The Mission. It's a story of a mercenary slave trader, played by Robert De Niro, by the way, who has spent his life basically going to remote parts of South America, finding uh, 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 finding Indian uh, uh, tribes and villages. And, and kidnapping uh, folks there and then taking them back and selling them as slaves. That was his occupation. He does that, but on one occasion when he gets back home, he discovers that his brother has entered into a relationship with his girlfriend. And he's living, so living, he murders his brother. immediately pained by that act. He takes shelter in a local church, a Jesuit church. The head of the church eventually sits down with him. He just wants to die. So guilt laden. And he says, I think I have a solution. I want you to join me and go to the top of the waterfalls for in our world an unreached people group to try to reach them with a message. That's the background. So what De Niro, what the uh, slave trader does, in order to pay penance for what he did, he takes a huge bed, fills it with armor, swords, all the stuff from his sinful life, fills that net, weighs several hundred pounds, okay? And he carries that around his neck with a rope to pay penance for his sin. Watch this. We hope. If it doesn't play, that's probably penance for my sin. <laughs> How many of you remember the movie? Remember? I watched it again. I let an idea. She wasn't real excited about it. She watched it and says, why, why, why do you want to watch depressing movies? Because I want to I want to depress 150 people Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Patty, that's all right. Just, just give me that. I need to, I, I need to go on. Okay. The whole point is, did he have to carry the load to pay for his sin? No. At one point in the movie, one of the priests cuts the rope. He's sick and tired of watching this guy do it. It falls all the way back down. He goes down, okay, and reties it around his neck and climbs again. Climbs again. Aren't you glad we don't have to do that? <laughs> Jesus wrote the check. Look at the next slide. Go to the next slide. Pay to write your name. 
the amount paid in full. In the memo, sign, Jesus. You ever been given a check? And maybe you didn't mean to, or maybe you did. And you never cashed it? What good was the check? The check is no good until what? What Jesus did for you and me, for all types of our sins, is no good. Unless you and I are willing to cast the check. Painful, but not to my benefit. Unless I'm willing to cast that's what he's saying in the passage. And then the last point, verses 6 to 11. I think forgiveness should change us. And this is part, I think, of what David is talking about. But David now moves from really his, what he has learned personally about his sin and God's forgiveness to really sending a message to everyone. In fact, that's what it, that's what it says. Therefore, in light of what's happened to me, if, if, if God has forgiven me, I committed adultery with a, with a married woman. I was deceptive. I had him killed. If God has forgiven me, and you probably have not done anything that bad, then I know He can forgive you. So He moves from Himself. Therefore, let everyone, let everyone know that there's a possibility. So, it's happened to me, it can happen to you, and it should change our lives. And notice these four or five things here. In verses 6 and 7, we should be more godly. Didn't say perfect, but more godly. We should know that we can run to God in times of trouble, and there perhaps is no more greater time of trouble than when you and I have sinned. We know, but instead... We run from God and try to hide it. We don't realize that the prodigal father is the main character in the son in the prodigal son story. It's not the ingratitude and the revolt and the rebellion of the son. It's the lavish forgiveness and mercy of the father who is intended to be a picture of our father of God. So be God. Next, look at verse 8. We need to let God guide us in our lives. Notice he says, I will instruct you, teach you, and counsel you. Those are three different terms. The idea there is I will instruct you, I will give you, uh, I will enlighten your mind, I will speak to you, I will give you a general understanding of what you need to know. Teach you is when you need to have a definite course laid out for something, I will speak to you to that level as well. And then last, when the very special circumstances come in life and you really need a word from me, I will speak to you in that as well. So this is not just a promise when forgiven of protection, but it's also a promise that God will go. What good is the protection and forgiveness if you don't know where to go to from there? Then next, verse 9. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding. In other words, don't be stubborn. Don't be hard-headed. Don't, uh, don't, be, uh, don't be proud. Some of the most uncomfortable conversations I've ever had over the years as a pastor is to meet with persons uh, uh, that were in sin and confront them, which is never a pleasant experience. Not even in my personality. Never a pleasant experience. And to have them look you in the face and say, I know what I've done is wrong. But I don't care. I'll take my chances with God. I can't count on all the digits in my body the number of Christian people that have looked me in the eye and said that. I'm going to do what I want to do and to hell with God. I don't want to be near them in the thunderstorm at <laughs> Right. First, uh, verse 10 basically says, and you got two choices. Right? You're going to live many of the sorrows of the wicked, but his steadfast covenant keeping love is around those who trust in him. Choose the way you want to live. And then the, the last, maybe the total 
result of knowing that you've been forgiven is the joy and the gladness that comes. Notice, be glad in the Lord, rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy. Three times he makes reference to uh, joy. What one of us in the room would not give anything to trade guilt for joy? Had you rather be like a telltale heart individual written by guilt? Or would you rather experience joy? Of course we'd rather experience joy. Then get honest with God. No wonder He closes. See Three times He says, See If David, listen, I've done a lot of sinful things, okay? And I'm not going to list them, and neither are you. Okay? But I've not done most of the things that David did. But I've wanted to many times. So my point is, if God is willing to convince David that my forgiveness is full, complete, and raised to life, then why would you and I this morning believe that for us? Right? Next week. Next week. I want you to read Psalm 34. Psalm 34. And then for a few minutes of discussion around the table, and uh, try not to go uh, uh, too long because we've got uh, 200 natives that are restless outside. Can you relate a time? I know this is hard. When you delay confessing some sin, okay, and then how you felt when you held on to that. Isn't it amazing how sometimes we do that, especially with other persons involved, and we feel like holding on to that somehow punishes them? <coughs> Nuts. Okay? Describe how you feel when you experience forgiveness. Maybe somebody else, but ultimately. Okay? Father, thank you for Psalm 32. It's a sobering psalm called we're all sinners. Yes, you have forgiven us, but yes, uh, we uh, we uh, still stumble and fall. Yes, you died for all of our sins. Yes, you paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future. But to maintain the, the joy of the, of the fellowship and the intimacy with you, we've got to come clean. Not so much for ourselves, but for you, but for ourselves. You know me. You know me. You kept caught by surprise when I thought we had or an accident that killed or a word that we said. Help us to embrace you as a prodigal God who's standing on the front porch looking arms wide open begging us to come home and find that full and complete forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray.